The following program, The Russ Belleville Show, is intended for responsible adults only. We advocate to the repeal of marijuana prohibition for adults. We discuss the science, culture, and controversy about America's marijuana laws. We do not advocate any illegal activity and encourage all listeners to learn their state and federal marijuana laws. Opinions and claims made by guests and advertisers on The Russ Belleville Show are their own and the Russ Belleville Show cannot be held legally responsible for their validity or reliability. Viewer discretion is advised. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it. And it goes down smooth. Hey! Spanning the continent to bring you the truth about cannabis and marijuana law reform. I smoke pot and I like it a lot. <laughs> From the promise of legalization. <laughs> to the agony of prohibition. And one major responsibility is to encourage people to use less drugs. The Rough Bellville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. <laughs> I hear you. You had a question for me. Now, here's your host, Radical Russ Belleville. We love it. Oh, yeah. Good day, Tokers and Tokens, and welcome. It is Tuesday, February 26, 2013. And it's got to be 420 somewhere in the world. So glad you could join us today. we got all sorts of news, interviews, and information for you today. Before we get to that, a quick uh, note about our media production here at 420 Radio. Starting yesterday, I am now packaging the show in not only its full one-hour format, but also separate posted videos for the rant, for the behind the headlines, and for the news segment. So, uh, yeah, so I hope you enjoy that be a whole lot easier to share some of these stories and share some of these videos on Facebook and throughout all your social networks. You can visit Radical Russ on YouTube. That's where I'll be posting all of these. I'll also have them on my blog at RadicalRuss.com if you'd like to share them from there. On today's show, all sorts of interesting stuff. Like I mentioned earlier, we begin with our students change the world segment that comes up at half past. We do that on the first and third Tuesday, I'm sorry, second and fourth Tuesdays of the month. Got to keep my Tuesdays straight. And we've got Shanna Frickless joining us today. She's from Lewis and Clark Law School, a transplant from Washington, D.C., who's an activist working for clean energy and the end of marijuana prohibition. We'll talk to her at half past, and she might even be in the studio. We're not sure yet. We're still trying to work that out. Also on today's show, at the end of the show, I got time for a radical rant. We're going to go in depth about jury nullification, a recent uh, sentencing of an activist to 145 days in jail for trying to educate people about jury nullification has uh, focused my attention on it, and we're going to talk all about that at the end of the show. Today is also our Daily Toker Tunes Electric Tuesday, and for Electric Tuesday today, I've got some music that I picked up from uh, one of the bands out there that I've met over the past couple of events. They're called Lift Off, and uh, the song is called High Sis, as in sister, so so uh, we'll check that out at 20 after the hour. In behind the headlines today, we're going to take another look at the Kathy Jordan case. She's the medical marijuana patient in Florida uh, for whom the constitutional amendment for medical marijuana is named. We brought you the news of her being raided yesterday. We've got some updates on that. Plus, I'm going to play a video from Kathy where she explains her story. And you can see just what a terrible drug kingpin the Manatee County Sheriff's Office brought down yesterday. Also, we have got our 420 Radio News. We've got news coming out of Spokane. Can on a new moratorium on marijuana businesses, some doctors in Washington state calling shenanigans on medical marijuana, Oklahoma medical marijuana has failed, Forbes magazine and employment law, and more coming up next. We'll be right back after these messages from our 420 friendly sponsors. Support these advertisers because their ad money goes straight to the Russ Belleville Show. You're tuned into the Russ Belleville Show. The voice of the marijuana nation. Cast your eyes up to the skies. What is it to live and die? The High Times Cannabis Cup in Amsterdam is recognized as the world's premier marijuana competition. Over the years, thousands of judges have attended the Cannabis Cup, sampling the best indicas, best sativas, best hybrids, and the best hash on the planet. In the April 2013 issue of High Times, 
Read all about the sensational 25th Cannabis Cup that took place in November. Find out about the latest killer strains. Decide what to grow in your garden this year. Celebrate 25 years of the Cannabis Cup in this very special issue of High Times Magazine. On sale now. Now it's time for your 420 Radio News for Tuesday, February 26, 2013. I'm Russ Belville. Spokane halts medical marijuana businesses fearing recreational loophole. The Spokane City Council passed a moratorium Monday on any new medical marijuana businesses in the city. Currently, about a dozen facilities are operating in the area. State laws on the operation of dispensaries are not clear, with the Department of Health saying they aren't legal, but a recent appeals court ruling seeming to say they are. The moratorium was not part of the public agenda for the council meeting. The council explained the agenda was kept secret to prevent a rush to form new marijuana businesses before the enactment of the moratorium. Council member John Snyder explained, quote, we need a time out, end quote, in order to see how the rules for recreational marijuana will be implemented. Then the city of Spokane can implement rules that apply to both recreational and medical marijuana outlets so entrepreneurs do not use the guise of medical use to gain advantages or utilize loopholes not available to recreational businesses. Lax standards for Washington medical marijuana cited by two doctors. Como News in Seattle is reporting on the statements of two medical professionals who liken their experiences at a Washington medical marijuana cl clinic as a, quote, marijuana mill and a cattle call, end quote. One, a naturopath, complained of seeing 30 or more patients per day, with her compensation directly tied to the number of patients she saw that day. The other, a registered nurse practitioner, complained that the clinic's businesses were all money-driven. Reporter Matt Markovich verified that it was easy for him to acquire a medical marijuana recommendation at South Sound Medicine, where both the women had worked. He notes that the recreational users of marijuana are only allowed one ounce of pot and places to acquire it do not exist yet. However, medical users can possess up to 24 ounces and can acquire marijuana at many pseudo-legal dispensaries in the Seattle area. In previous reports, Markovich has shown how lax the oversight over medical marijuana recommendations can be. At one Tacoma clinic known for issuing cannabis recommendations with no appointment, he reports that he sat in a packed waiting room and filled out a questionnaire saying he had an occasional headache. Before he saw a doctor, he paid $139. In another room, expecting a regular doctor, instead found a state-licensed advanced registered nurse practitioner Skyping in from Hawaii. He told the doctor from Hawaii he suffered occasional headaches and had no medical records to back up the claim. The Skype visit lasted three minutes, and he walked out with a recommendation saying, I have di diagnosed this patient as having a terminal or debilitating condition. Oklahoma Senate Committee rejects medical marijuana in first ever hearing. An Oklahoma Senate committee has rejected a medical marijuana bill in the first ever hearing held on the issue in Oklahoma. The 6 to 2 vote was split along party lines, with the Republicans defeating the proposal. However, the senator who introduced the bill is proclaiming a victory of sorts. Senator Constance Johnson, a Democrat from Oklahoma City, said, quote, I consider it a victory for the citizens of this state, end quote. She has introduced several bills over the last six years to allow for the medical use of marijuana or to ease penalties for possession of the drug. She continued, quote, I think it's a step in the right direction in terms of moving it forward and getting some indication of what people's reservations are so we'll know what to address, end quote. The Oklahoma Senate rules prevent Senator Johnson from reintroducing a medical marijuana measure for two years. Chairman Senator Brian Crane says he opposed the measure, but finally permitted it a hearing because of Senator Johnson's persistence. Senators who opposed the measure worried that recreational marijuana smokers would take advantage of the medical use law. Forbes magazine warns employers about marijuana and employment law. Forbes magazine notes that as majorities continue to support changes in marijuana law, employers must confront the fact their so-called drug-free workplace may need to be modified to accord with the new state law. In California, Colorado, Michigan, Montana, Nevada, Oregon, and Washington, businesses need not currently in 
accommodate employees who legally use marijuana for medicinal purposes. Washington's statute, for example, says that employers may establish drug-free work policies and nothing requires to accommodate the medical use of marijuana. Marijuana use laws in Arizona, Connecticut, Delaware, Maine, and Rhode Island expressly forbid businesses from refusing to hire applicants and from disciplining and otherwise adversely affecting the employment of registered medical marijuana cardholders based solely on that status. For more information, check out RadicalRust.com. That's your 420 Radio News for Tuesday, February 26, 2013. I'm Russ Belville. When we come back, we go behind the headlines for the raid of Kathy Jordan, the medical marijuana patient in Florida, on the same day a poll comes out showing 70% support for the bill named after her. We've got updates on that story and video for you next in Behind the Headlines. The law offices of Omar Figueroa would like to remind you to stand up for your rights. Please do not give up your precious liberties. There's nothing wrong with standing up for our constitutional rights, and in fact, it's the only way to honor the Constitution that recognizes our natural rights. Treat law enforcement with respect and respect the Constitution by standing up for your rights. If you are detained or arrested, stand up for your rights by repeating, I respectfully invoke all my legal and constitutional rights. I do not consent to any search and seizure. I want to remain silent, and I want to speak to my attorney, Omar Figueroa. Omar Figueroa has more than a decade of experience in federal and California courts and graduated from Yale University, Stanford Law School, and Trial Lawyers College. Please contact the law offices of Omar Figueroa at 415-489-0420 or 707-829-0215 or on the web at www.omarfigueroa.com. Welcome back, everybody. 13 after the hour. Time for us to go behind the headlines. And yesterday I reported on Kathy Jordan, the 24-year Lou Gehrig's disease survivor who uh, was raided by the Manatee County Sheriff's Office in Florida. New details from the raid. They showed up with guns drawn and wearing ski masks. They made no arrests, but they seized 23 marijuana plants Kathy was using for her medical purposes. I thought you might like to meet the lady who is such a drug scare in the state of Florida. Hello, my name is Catherine Jordan. In 1986, I was diagnosed with amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, ALS, New Gehrig's disease. I was only 36 years old. This is quite devastating to me. Um, in 1989, while on vacation in Florida, I just happened to use cannabis. Um, when I used the cannabis, I realized my disease had stopped. I never knew that there was a low level hum in my body until I had used the cannabis. At first, I told my doctors that my disease stopped, and they thought I had a form of dementia. I was not handling I demise very well. Well, now the science is out there to back me up. There are so many people out there that I know that have died from this disease. And this is a devastating disease. And these people could have been using cannabis just the same way as I am. And for anyone out there that does not believe that there are people out there in wheelchairs buying marijuana. I, you just met one. I mean, I go out and I use cannabis every day. If I do not, I cannot cough. I cannot control my saliva. Um, I cannot sneeze. These things I all do because I use cannabis. In the first three years of having this disease, I lost the use of my arms. Since then, when I began to use cannabis, 
Um, I regain my balance. I, um, my speech got better. Um, I became a lot healthier. Um, I became more focused on my life. I believe politics need to be changed. There is no reason not to study the brain and cannabis. It can help AOS, um, MS, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's. I believe you can possibly find the cure for autism in cannabis. This is a God-given herb. I will continue to smoke it only because I know it keeps me alive. The science is out there, and it's finally caught up with me. And there are um, reports um, researchers can look into. Um, there are studies that have been made. There are doctors that um, know all about how the glycamate works. Um, I am just a patient. I know that cannabis helps me mostly because um, I have the ability to cough and the um, ability to sneeze. Um, I can eat food. Um, the only thing that is really wrong about using cannabis as medicine is my fear of the rest. If I was to be in the front seat, and I call her, and the police said, put your hands up. I would be out of luck only because they would never know I had my hands up. It is time that we come out of, of the dark ages on medical science. Anyone who has ever used cannabis recreationally, you know when you smoke that it dries up your mouth. It gives you cotton mouth. It makes you cough. These things that people with AOS cannot do. I lost the ability to actually cough. I would choke on my saliva while watching television, and in no way I would just choke. And when I began using cannabis, not when I want. So, um, I am doing this mainly for all the people out there that have AOS. So, um, I really think that the study should be done. I don't think I know. I know the study should be done. Um, and this has slowed this disease down for me and for other IELTS patients that I have met across the country and right in my own area. There are patients out there in wheelchairs that have to go to the street to buy cannabis for the medicine. Um, this helps with many um, neurological problems and the study of the brain and then it makes sense that cannabis would help solve issues with the brain. Um, I mean Parkinson's disease. They are studying Alzheimer's and cannabis. Um, there are many diseases but there is not I would prefer to smoke cannabis only because it helps in my lungs, and um, I don't think this is going to be done every night. I just do not want to see patients being arrested for trying to stay alive and using a natural cure. Um, I know you do not believe that this is a cure, but um, there was no way I could have stopped this disease um, other than my medicine. That is the only thing I changed in my life at that time. So, please, I hope and pray that you will take the time to investigate the science. Because once you do, you will know, as I do, that this can slow the progression 
of AOS. Thank you. That's Kathy Jordan uh, from the Cannabis Patient Network and Patients Out of Time. Check out medicalcannabis.com and pa- cannabispatientnetwork.com for more information. I got the link to that video up there in our uh, chat room. We'll also put that up on radicalrust.com. I interviewed uh, Kathy Jordan back in 2009. I'll find that link for you as well. Oh, have you ever met that funny repo man? A repo man. Have you ever met that funny reefer man, a reefer man? If he said he swam to China, he would send you South Carolina. Then you know you talking to that reefer man. Big Daddy Think. Funky Roller Ring, Roller Ring, Roller Ring. Oh yeah, this is Big Daddy, and I'll be your freakazoid every Thursday night, right here at the Funky Roller Rink. Mm. Funky Roller Rink. 11 Eastern, 8 Pacific, only on RadicalRust.com. Everyone knows music and marijuana go together. So let's wind up our 20 after break with the Russ Belleville Show's Daily Toker Tunes, the best in pod safe 420 music from around the web. Today is Electric Tuesday, featuring the latest in electronic dance music and other cutting edge genres. You can get downloads and more information about all our Daily Toker Tunes by visiting music.radicalrust.com. Now, sit back and enjoy your Daily Toker Tunes. Welcome back, everybody. One of the fun things about doing this job is going to the various uh, campus cups and hemp fests and events that are held all around the country. And one of the things that happens when you're doing this is people walk by and give you stuff. And one of the things you get a lot of are CDs. Got a lot of different artists out there. And now that the technology is so available for people to be able to cut and press their own CDs that I get a lot of music from a lot of different groups. Today, I decided to go through the stack of CDs and start uh, ripping some of them into the Libramator. Give us some new tunes to listen to. And I found this one from a band called Liftoff. Kind of a high energy alternative band. Uh, not so much electronic dance music, but kind of an electronic-ish sound. They're out of the Vancouver, British Columbia. Uh, in the alternative scene up there featuring a lead guitar, bass, drums, rhythm guitar, and lead vocals, plus a whole bunch of uh, uh, keyboard stuff. Uh, Great uh, website available for them at liftoffband.com if you'd like to check that out and uh, you can find uh, all the contact information there as well. And this reminds me also that uh, for our 420 radio, you know, it's all about cannabis community radio. And here at the Russ Belvel Show, we have a different genre every day for our daily toker tunes. We are looking for a music editor for this day for Electric Tuesday. So if you're uh, if you're really knowledgeable on electronic dance music, pop, synth pop, dance style tracks, we'd love to hear from you. All we need is one track a, a week. We did find someone for our hip-hop editor for Thursday. That's Rob G. He'll be debuting this Thursday. If you'd like to help us program the Tuesday music, just let me know. Go to 420radio.org, look on the main menu for the contact link, and uh, look for Radical Russ in the uh, contact list there, and send me send me an email. Tell me uh, if you'd like to get involved, and uh, we'll make you a part of the 420 Radio family. All right, let's turn to the music. This song is called Hi Sis, like hi... And sis like sister, I hope you enjoy it. This is Liftoff.
You still don't get it, do you? All right, let me make this as clear as I possibly can. This is your brain. This is drugs. This is your brain on drugs. Any questions? Georgia. Hi, this is Willie Nelson and I need your help. Alcohol prohibition didn't work in the 20s and marijuana prohibition isn't working today. It's time we stop arresting law-abiding citizens because they prefer marijuana over alcohol. Nearly 2,000 Americans are arrested every day on marijuana charges. We're unfairly destroying the lives and careers of hundreds of thousands of people each year simply because they smoke marijuana. These are not criminals, they're average citizens like you, good neighbors who work hard, raise families, pay taxes, and contribute to their communities. We need your help to end marijuana prohibition once and for all. It's the fair thing to do. For more information, contact Normal, the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws. Call toll-free 888-67-NORML or visit their website at NOR. Beanie Madison speaks her mind about the presidential election. Well, it's the day after the presidential election, and I have to tell you that I am shocked. I am just shocked that we have elected this man for two terms. I, mean, I thought one year was bad enough, but now we have him for, for four more years. He's, we don't even know what his intention is. We don't know what he's going to do in this world. You know, he did the whole Obamacare. Well, I got to tell you, if you don't have enough money to pay for your own insurance, well, then you're just not really living the American dream, because there's a problem with that. Everybody that I know in my neighborhood, we all have insurance. My husband has insurance. My little boy has. We're all insured. We're all really insured. I'm just going to enjoy this donut here. I don't want you to think. I am not, because I tell people this, I don't want to be shocking to them. When I go to curves, you know, I tell my friends, I go, why don't you vote for Mitt Romney? I mean, at least he's close to being Christian. He's Mormon. I mean, like, at least there's Jesus in there somewhere. I mean, with Barack, I mean, with the name Hussein, I mean, what kind of like, what kind of thing does, you know, what does that mean? What does that say? Does that, is he Muslim? Is he, I mean, what religion is he? I mean, I, I, he's not, that's not even Jewish. Okay? It's not even Jewish. I don't even know. And he's all present now. I just don't even believe he's, they say, well, they say that every fruit, President is somehow related to one another. Like there's something where they go, oh, they all have the same bloodline. But this guy, this guy doesn't have the same bloodline. And I think we need to check that out because there's something really, really wrong with that. Now, I don't want to, I'm not racist. I'm not racist because I, I know that I need to be a good Christian and I need to believe in Jesus just like everybody else. As a matter of fact, my little boy, Billy Madison, he, well, I don't mind if he brings over like little, the, the little brown boy that comes over to the house. I don't mind him. But what I did think it was interesting was that his name was Fernando. And I thought, well, that's a real name? I thought that was an Abba song. Activism begins with ACT. The Rush Belleville Show features the stories of hardworking grassroots activists working for an end to prohibition in today's activist agenda. All right, welcome back, everybody. And uh, joining us by Skype, we have got, and I hope I get this name correct, Shanna Frickless. Have I pronounced that correctly, Shanna? Yes, Russ, that's correct. Oh, fan oh fantastic. fantastic. And you're and on video as well. Was, it sounds like sound you're going to get a little bit of little, echo. Do you have any sort of sorry. headphones or anything that you can uh, uh, put on by any chance? Or I, I can I can mute this as well from my side if we have to. I will 
do my best. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Uh, while you're putting those headphones on, I will get the uh, video set up here. Uh, Shanna is a student at uh, Lewis and Clark Law School and uh, moved out here from, I understand, moved out here from Washington, D.C., so that's pretty exciting. Uh, tell us uh, what made you want to come to uh, Portland, Oregon, from all the way out from Washington, D.C.? Things about Portland, and I wanted to... Explore a new city, and Lewis and Clark is the best school for energy policy, so that's what I want to end up doing. Um, I like the liberal attitude, and I feel like I can get along well with it. Excellent. And uh, so so uh, you're primarily uh, in law school, like you said, for, for energy policy, and you came out here from Washington, D.C. Uh, what's, what's frustrating you right now about uh, the politics in our energy policy, and why is Portland uh, the place you want to be to try to make a change for that? Uh, I think that there's a lot of red tape that is unnecessary in Washington politics. And um, to be an activist, you need to be around other people who are actively um, involved in what you're interested in. And one of the best places to learn is from other people who, like I said, are doing similar things. They're very passionate about um, the, you know, re and renewable energy, and specifically Portland is very good with that, and making lots of moves as far as wind power and solar power, and um, all of that kind of thing. So. Uh -huh. Yeah, you know, I've, it's something I've noticed as well. Uh, you know, we head east from uh, down the gorge, and you're going to see a whole bunch of those wind towers up there now, the big windmills. So uh, we see plenty of wind power. Solar, maybe not so much. We don't see a whole lot right. of the sun out here, but uh, we're we're hoping for some. Uh, now, I, I got uh, your contact through uh, Sam Chapman. I understand you're also uh, in school with uh, Bradley Steinman, big friends of the show. Yeah, I, he told me that he's been to your studio a number of times, and I'm disappointed I wasn't able to come and see it. I've heard good things. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Now, of course, Bradley and uh, Sam are involved a lot in the uh, in the movement here to end marijuana prohibition, and I'm wondering if, if that's also something that uh, concerns you and how that might tie into energy policy. Um, well, medical marijuana is something that um, I'm very passionate about for uh, somewhat different reasons than my energy policy interests um, and being in Portland, et cetera, uh, mainly because my stepdad has uh, MS and uh, my sister has um, autoimmune deficiency um, and disorder that um, both of them would not be doing as well as they would be if it weren't for the help of medical cannabis. Okay. And um, I think that it is a very important issue to get behind and uh, wanted to be um, actively trying to support that if you can't go to... Washington or, or be active in your communities and uh, speak out about what you are passionate about, then, you know, you can't complain, in my opinion. You know, the, the one aspect where I see uh, marijuana policy and energy policy intersecting would be in the use of industrial hemp. Is that something that you've taken a look at? Um, not exactly. Um, as I know there is a background. Uh, there's diff four faces of cannabis is what I learned this weekend. I like that kind of rhetoric. And hemp is one of them. Me medical, um, recreational, and uh, spiritual are the other three that I was told. Um, but I haven't looked into that specific. So, so it's, it's, it's like a, a whole new issue then uh, for you. And I imagine being out here in Portland, you're, you're getting a whole lot of information uh, coming at you really quickly now, huh? But definitely. <laughs> and uh, thanks to Bradley and Sam, um, they, I feel like I have a lot of good information and uh, they both are very much encyclopedias on the issue. Oh yeah. Now, uh, you know, having, having come up through uh, Washington DC, there's a lot of, you know, political rhetoric about marijuana all the time. Uh, now that you've moved out here, is there any uh, misconceptions that you used to have that now have been completely blown out of the water? Hmm. That's a hard one. I mean, I've, I've, uh, it's, I, I like the rhetoric that people have out here mm -hmm. as far as um, trying to counter other people's misconceptions, like that um, anybody who is for medicinal also wants it legalized completely, or that people who are trying to get it for their ailments are really just trying to have a legal way to smoke recreationally, uh, things like that. Uh, but those have never been my misconceptions. Okay, so you, you've always kind of had an open mind with regard to the issue, but not like studied it in depth before. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, you know, because uh, 
I always imagine, you know, it's hard for me to imagine sometimes what it's like growing up on the East Coast and hearing about these things and growing up with the just say no's and all that. Uh, having grown up, uh, you know, on the West Coast is somewhat of a different mentality. Do, do you find that, that there's like just a different attitude about weed East and West? Definitely, definitely. Uh, I, I mean, especially Portland. Um, I, I mean, I can't say this about every city on the West Coast, um, but I, I grew up in California. Also, I just okay. came from Washington D.C., so I'm familiar with that attitude. Okay. So, um, but it it definitely is is somewhat different. Um, although I feel like people on the East Coast, among my age group, is pretty open minded as well. When did you end up uh, moving to D.C.? Uh, after college, I was there for two years. Oh, okay. Uh, so did you you went to school in California and everything else? No, I went to school in Pennsylvania. I've been uh, bouncing all over the wow, country. Wow, okay. So yeah. you got quite a perspective on on a, on a bunch of different areas of the country here, and you know that that's always interesting to me when I I meet people that are in law school and and, and moving forward. Is I want to make sure they have a lot of real world experience with the laws that they're going to be you know uh, affecting here. Is is marijuana something that uh, you use personally for any particular reasons? Um, I'm not a patient. Mm -hmm. um, no. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. That's enough. That's all we need to say about that. But uh, obviously something that uh, that you're supporting as far as uh, people that are trying to you know legalize here in the state of Oregon. Yeah. One of the most convincing um, things that I heard this weekend that um, I think rings true and um, you know, I'd like to come out saying on your show is that if it... If, if cannabis came out today, it would be considered a miracle drug, but it's really the stigma that it has and uh, uh, that really characterizes it, I think, in today's politics. And once you can get beyond that, I think that um, really our cause to trying to get it provided to people, uh, patients who need it, is, um, uh, you know, 100% uh, irrefutable. Mm. Excellent. All right. Now I want to go back to your, uh, your, what you're studying, you know, the energy policy and, and becoming a, a lawyer there at, at Lewis and Clark. And I think a lot of people, when they hear law school, uh, they think about litigation that, you know, you're going to learn how to be a trial lawyer and go in there and I object, you know, all that kind of stuff that you see in the, in the movies. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, how is law school, uh, informing your career as far as energy policy? I mean, are, are, is this something you use to sue people for polluting or just to create policy? How does that all work? Um, it's funny that you ask that because one of my frustrations with 1L year, uh, that's what we call first year of law school, 1L, um, is that I, uh, I'm not able to take those classes yet about the Clean Air Act and about um, you know being able to be an activist on this issue, even though Lewis and Clark is known as the, uh, one of the best schools in the country. I think it has competing with Vermont for the best school in the country for energy and environmental policy and, and law. Um, so right now I am learning all of the litigation and the civil procedure and the criminal procedure and the contracts. and um, It's all important stuff for, for being a member of society, I think, is interesting. But as far as my career path is um, not as relevant as I might have hoped that you know, my class that I'd be taking in law school would be. But on the side, I'm doing things like uh, the Northwest Environmental Defense Center, what we call the NEDC, where we look at uh, permits that are requested from different emitters in the area and review them and uh, for consistency with the Clean Air Act and making sure that they're abiding by all the rules and regulations that they should be and writing to the DEQ and the EPA um, suggesting that they look at certain things closer. And right now that's my main experience and um, a lot of people in not-for-profits and the other um, you know, governmental branches, is, you have to do the regulations and the, the, the checking as well as the policy making. And so that's my experience so far. Uh, I, my experience in D.C. was definitely with litigation. Mm -hmm. So I have seen a lot of the facets of law and know that this is really where I want to be practicing. Excellent. Excellent. So do you see yourself, do you see yourself litigating in the future once you get, once you clear the bar? They're definitely are opportunities for environmental litigation, um, suing companies for not having best practices or uh, things like that when it comes to air, clean air emissions. Or, I mean, air is really just my focus. There's, there's lands and wildlife. There's all different kinds of things. Um, 
it's entirely possible. Who knows? I've been told to keep an open mind because it's a tough job market out there. Uh, you know, you mentioned uh, that you're you're uh, concentrating on clean air, and with that in mind, it brings to my uh, brings to my mind a, a a talking point I've heard for a while, even from President Obama. A couple of words. I'll just throw them out to you and get your reaction. Clean coal. Heard of this clean coal allegedly? I can't hear you anymore. Oh, I'm sorry. We're back. Okay, yeah, yeah. now I hear you. Yeah. Sorry, say that again. Uh, have you heard of this uh, so-called clean coal and what you have to think what you think about that? <laughs> yes, uh, they call it CCS or um, carbon capturing storage technology, and it certainly is an avenue that can be used to uh, make coal uh, more environmentally viable resource being that it is such a prevalent resource in the United States it would allow us to use local um, things that we already have instead of trying to invest outside the country or um, in otherwise uh, renewable energy that's a little bit more expensive on the other hand in and of itself it is expensive um, and kind of does still have byproducts like uh, that of nuclear uh, so it is not flawless yeah it's it's frustrating to us uh in the marijuana field you know knowing what we know about industrial hemp and and the the biofuel that can be produced from that and with very you know not only very little environmental impact but actually environmental benefit from you know pulling greenhouse gases from the from the air you know just in the growing of the hemp crops so when we when we we hear th those of us on our side we hear things like clean coil and shale oil technologies and nuclear and we think of all the the waste and all the environmental problems with that it just frustrates us to no end that because of prohibition we can't take a look at what would be a very you know simple way of producing more energy in this country. Um, I wish I knew more about that, and I definitely will look into it. Now that I had this conversation with you, I didn't realize that um, hemp could have positive environmental impact. Well, you know, this is a perfect segue because on tonight's edition of A Different View at 8 o'clock tonight right here on 420 Radio, Jen and Iva are dedicating the whole show to hemp. So, uh, you know, maybe you'll be, maybe you get a chance to tune in or call in even, and uh, we'll talk more about it. That sounds amazing. I would love to tune in and listen. All right. Hey, uh, Shanna uh, Frickless from Lewis and Clark Law School, I want to thank you here for joining us on the Russ Belleville Show, and you're welcome to come to the studio anytime you wish. Thank you so much. It was wonderful to talk to you. All right. Say, hey, say hi to Brad and Sam for me, too. <laughs> I certainly will. Have a great day. All right. You, too. All right, folks, that's uh, that's our Students Save the World segment for the day. And uh, when we come back, we have time for a radical rant. I'm going to take you deep into the history of jury nullification. The voice of the Marijuana Nation. The Russ Belleville Show. Chat is for friends 18 and older. We expect our chat to be civil, mature, and free from excessive profanity. If you don't like these rules, there are approximately 6 billion other chat rooms with lower standards that you can visit. I'm Sub Cool from Team Green Avenger. At TGAgenetics.com, we are working on the leading edge of medical strains. Our strains are rigorously tested for THC, CBD, THCV, and other critical cannabinoids. Know your grow. Check out our genetic diversity at TGAgenetics.com. The home of Jelly Bean, Jack the Ripper, Vortex, and other award-winning cannabis strains. Drugs make me strong. Drugs make me smart. Drugs make me feel good. Drugs make me cool. You believe that crap? Huh? You believe all that stuff they're handing you about drugs? You want to believe in something? How about yourself? Don't do drugs. 
You want answers? I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore. You want answers? You have offended my family. I think I'm entitled. You want answers? I want the truth. And you have offended a Shaolin temple. You can't handle the truth. Surely you can't be serious. I am serious. And don't call me Shirley. Hoorah! Radical Brand. All right, folks, uh, we're going to tell you a little bit about your rights as a juror in this country. Uh, if you ever get called on to jury duty and manage to make it to trial, there's a little right you need to know about. And we got to tell it to you now before you get to trial. Because if you get to trial, it's just too late. Let's unravel this just a little bit. There's a story I saw that uh, floated across the news wires uh, where an activist, and it wasn't a marijuana activist, this activist got uh, sentenced and he, and he started serving on Thursday a 145-day jail sentence for passing out flyers at the courthouse about jury nullification. So I figured, hey, this is as good a reason as any for us to talk a little bit about this concept of jury nullification, which goes all the way back to the American colonies in fact, it goes back to the, you know, the British Empire even before that. And the idea is pretty simple. Juries have the right to not only determine the guilt or innocence of the defendant, but to judge the justice of the individual application of the law to that defendant or the morality of the law in general. Now, the practice of juries nullifying verdicts dates all the way back to, you know, pre-Civil War days. There used to be a Fugitive Slave Act. You know, if you have a slave escaped from the South and ran up North and, and you harbored that fugitive slave, you could be prosecuted. But in the North, they had trouble getting juries to actually convict people of this because a lot of the Northerners were abolitionists who believed that slavery was evil. And even though there was a law against it, that we shouldn't punish people who are helping fugitive slaves. Back during the uh, early 20th century, uh, you know, as temperance movements moved across the country and finally enacted alcohol prohibition, Wet juries, and they used to call people who supported alcohol drinking wets. There was wets and dries. Wet juries also used to refuse to convict people for liquor law violations in a, in a lot of states where they didn't really approve of alcohol prohibition. And even as recently as the 1960s and 70s, we had cases where juries were refusing to convict protesters of the Vietnam War, protesters who would, you know, block trains that were trying to take bombs to the army bases and such. So the court, while they had to prove beyond a doubt that somebody might have hidden a slave or sold a beer or blocked a recruiting office or something like that, the jury could then decide that, if, that the defendant that broke that law was justified. You know, well, he was justified hiding that slave because slavery is illegal. Or that the law itself was just unjust. That we shouldn't convict people under this law because the law is wrong. And it's, it's a right that every jury in America maintains to this day. It's a right that every American has as a juror. It's one of the most important rights we have. Our founding fathers wrote about this right as being the last bastion. I think it was Thomas Jefferson who said it was the last bastion against the tyranny of the state was the, the, the impartial citizen jury that could decide not just whether you're guilty of the law, but whether the law itself was just. So why is this such a new concept to some of you? Why, why are some of you listening to this rant going, huh? Jury nullification, never heard of that, right? Well, you know about the uh, Miranda rights, right? You know about those. Why aren't we told about these jury rights that we have? Because in any situation where informing you of your jury rights makes sense, you know, like at the courthouse or during the trial, it is illegal to inform you of that right. <laughs> yeah, you get the Miranda rights. You get arrested and the police have to say, you know, you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you. You have the right to an attorney. And if you cannot afford one, one will be provided for you by the court, blah, 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 right? They, they give the whole Miranda warning, right? Because once you're arrested... Your, your legal status changes. You're now a suspect in a crime, and we got to inform you of your basic level of rights, your right to counsel, your right to remain silent, because you're innocent until proven guilty in America, and we give you these warnings so you have some minimal level of awareness, right? So you have some level of protection against the state, which, you know, has the judicial system and the cops and the guns and the money and the time, right? You got to have some level of protection. But if you're a juror, 
and you're trying to decide whether or not a particular suspect is guilty or innocent in court, you're not allowed to be informed of your rights under the Constitution as an arbiter of that law. You may only be aware of jury nullification if you learned about it anywhere else other than in or near a courtroom at a time not near that of the trial you're the juror for. <laughs> so that's what I'm telling you now, folks. Because by the time you're picked for jury duty, by the time you get into the courtroom, it's too late. We can't tell you about it. It's maddening, isn't it? Now, this this is the case. The case is this fellow by the name of Mark Schmitter, and uh, he's uh, a jury nullification activist. He goes around lots of places and tries to inform people of their rights. He began serving a 145-day jail sentence last Thursday for passing out jury nullification flyers outside of a courthouse. Uh, according to the report, Vietnam-era veteran, peaceful freedom activist, and local small businessman Mark Schmitter has been jailed for 145 days by Judge Belvin Perry. Uh, Schmitter's sentence began Thursday after he was found guilty for distributing jury nullification info outside of Perry's self-imposed free speech zone during the Casey Anthony trial. Okay, so try and put aside any concerns that the goal here may have been to get Casey Anthony found not guilty of murdering her daughter through jury nullification, and she was acquitted of murder, manslaughter, and child abuse anyway. So let's just forget what the case was about. The point was he was trying to get jury nullification across to the people. The report continues, Mark E. Schmitter is an activist for jury rights whose story we covered one year ago. He was originally facing a year in jail after being found guilty of two felonies, external criminal contempt of court, and jury tampering for distributing information outside the Orange County Courthouse in Florida. Schmitter was found not guilty of any actual law, but of rules that were written by the judge at the time. The rules that he was in violation of were for demonstrating outside of a free speech zone that was determined by this judge. He was first arrested in June 2011, maintains his innocence, and says the judge's orders that he violated were a direct violation of the First Amendment of the Constitution. Later on, an appeals court agreed that the rule saying that you could have a free speech zone for the courthouse protesters was indeed wrong. However, they still said that passing out this literature, this particular literature, could be banned outside of the court. So, yes, you have the free speech rights. Yes, you can protest in front of the courthouse. But there's just certain things you cannot say. And the one thing you cannot say is that juries have the right to not convict for any reason they choose. You can't say that. Now, keeping this, this jury nullification power secret, this has been the law of the land since 1895, people. In 1895, the Supreme Court decided judges do not have to inform juries of their nullification right. So you're sitting on a jury, but the judge doesn't have to tell you that you don't have to find people guilty if you don't like the law. Right. They don't have to tell you that in 1969, the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals recognized the power of the jury to acquit regardless of the law and to not be punished for their verdicts. OK, but they also decided that juries should not be directly informed of that right, lest they be enticed to nullification first before deciding the law. The idea here is all right, jury. We got, we got videotape of a guy holding 10 pounds of weed and uh, he signed a statement admitting that he had 10 pounds of weed and there's 60 people testifying against him that says he has 10 pounds of weed. But you as a juror can decide that busting people for 10 pounds of weed is a bad idea and you can vote to acquit. But there's a catch. <laughs> Check this out. In 1972, the D.C. Circuit Court upheld that precedent about, you know, not telling jurors about the nullification power and further clarified that defense attorneys cannot inform the jurors of their rights to nullify a verdict. And in 1997, the Second Circuit Court of Appeals held that a juror could be removed from a jury if there's evidence that he or she intends to engage in jury nullification. 
So yeah, you can nullify the verdict. You can have the guy in front of you for 10 pounds of weed and all other of the 11 jurors can say that he's guilty of sin. And you can say, no, this person's innocent. I will not convict this person. But you can only do that if you don't admit in any way that you're doing it because you don't like the law. If you say that you're doing it because you don't like the law because you're, you're intending to nullify the verdict, they can remove you from that jury for uh, misconduct. It's a prosecutorial misconduct kind of thing, you know, like a tampering kind of thing, right? So you have the right to let that guy go for his 10 pounds of weed, but only if you're letting him go out of good faith that you believe the, the government didn't prove its case, not because you're nullifying a law. In other words, it's almost like a thought crime, right? If you vote not to acquit, we can't punish you unless we can prove that you voted not to acquit for a specific reason because you were upholding your right to nullify a verdict and you let us know that you were doing that. So you can exercise the right so long as no one tells you what the right is, so long as the right remains secret, and so long as you do not indicate that you are using that right in any way, you're free to nullify a verdict. Is this madness or what? Now, if you want to learn more about this, I encourage you to go visit flexyourrights.org. They've got a page up on jury nullification. I think it's like jury-nullification, something like that on the URL. Uh, and I've got a link to it at radicalrust.com. They are making a film. They're proposing to make a film to train you about your rights and how to behave and how to act as far as getting on a jury. They made an excellent film, the Flex Your Rights, uh, the, what was that called? Um, oh, Busted. Busted, the, the Guide to Surviving Police Encounters that shows you how to survive a car stop, a street stop, and a house stop, you know, a knock and talk uh, from the cops. They made a follow-up video that emphasizes some of the uh, realities, shall we say, of being black and having to go through those same situations. It's another great video from FlexureRights.org. This one they want to make. Uh, for informing people about their jury rights. They still need some donations for that uh, to put put together the budget they'll need. You can check out FlexureRights.org. I think this is an important project because if you're like me, you didn't know you had these rights. I didn't know I had this jury right until I started getting involved with the marijuana movement. They don't teach you this stuff in school. They should, but they don't teach you this stuff in school. They don't t teach you your bill of rights. They don't teach you how to deal with police officers. This is the kind of stuff where our activist community is actually providing the civic education that our American school system is so desperately failing to provide people. And I'm telling you folks, if more people knew their rights and, and exercised their rights, if they all exercised their right to a jury trial, for example, if we stopped doing this plea bargain system, if we stopped relying on criminal informants, if we educated people about jury nullification, hell, this prohibition would have been over years ago. They can only keep us down if they keep us ignorant. And that's why we're here five days a week right here at 420radio.org, Russ Belvel Show, bringing you the best education, information, and entertainment we can. Tell everyone you know, spread the word, we'll be here for you. That's all the time we got for Hour 1. We'll be back with Hour 2. More talk and your phone calls at 971-533-7111. For Brian the Red, I'm Radical Russ. And until next time, take care of each other, tokers. This is the Russ Belleville Show. The Russ Belleville Show is blogging and podcasting daily at RadicalRuss.com. You grow it, you try it, you roll it, you smoke it. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you try it, you roll it, you smoke it. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you try it, you roll it, you smoke it, and it goes down smooth. I'm your Khalifa, I'm your, 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 I'm your
Oh, yeah, oh, about yeah. my money. Yeah. If you not, I see you later. I take out the first two letters and say hi hi to you haters. I got rooms with elevators. Yeah, they say I'm futuristic. Got an iPhone for business, but the psychics for the bitches. I'm your Khalifa. I'm your Khalifa. I'm your Khalifa. I'm your Khalifa.